Well, good morning and welcome to our first installment into the world of polymers and plastics primarily. Um, I hope to change some of your minds with respect to your uh, general feeling about plastics and polymers, thinking there's some sort of inferior material, not worth much, inexpensive, always breaking, etc., etc. Um, that's absolutely incorrect uh, thoughts uh, because primarily uh, when plastics fail it's because they've been destined to fail because of the application that they were put into um, and so what what needs to take place of course like with all materials is to understand their properties and the effects of, of outside um, atmospheres outside influences outside uh, situations service uh, conditions etc uh, to better place the right plastic in the right application uh, so at any rate and think of think of our world without plastics and uh, that would be extremely difficult uh, if not uh, deadly for many many people uh, because plastics think of plastics in the world of the medical field nowadays, honestly, uh, their plastics are so prevalent in the uh, in society as a whole, but specifically in the medical field, where there's so many advancements just because of different types of plastics that are um, have been developed uh, by the polymer uh, scientists and engineers. So at any rate, and I will show you some examples or talk to you about some examples of those in hopes of thinking, uh, changing some of your minds that uh, plastics truly can be a superior uh, material in the right applications. Okay, so uh, what I, I gave yesterday was, of course, the important terms and concepts. Um, and then now I want to start going into some of the uh, basics here this morning. Uh, and we'll continue on through this. Um, but let's first of all look at the word polymer. Uh, it is derived from a Greek word, uh, two words, poly, meaning many, and mer, uh, meaning units. So polymer, meaning obviously many units. Um, and that's exactly how we would define a polymer. Uh, the polymer is a large molecule, which we call a macromolecule, that is composed of repeating, emphasis repeating, structural units. And these uh, subunits are typically connected, uh, bonded together uh, through covalent chemical bonds, through the sharing of those electrons, as you recall, a covalent bond is about. Uh, and these long chain molecules uh, can consist of thousands upon thousands of repeat units in a single polymer molecule. And what you need to think of, perhaps, is a big, large string of beads, uh, or maybe one of these beaded pull chains that you know you see on on ceiling fans, et cetera, et cetera. But imagine one just being, you know, a hundred yards long or something, and that being just one molecule. All right, um, because it's it's just they're connected on upon a chain, upon a chain, upon a chain. Uh, and, and repeating units. And so we'll get into the details of that um, here in just a little bit. But um, polymers are based primarily on carbon atoms. And uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, their hydrocarbons are derived from petroleum. Uh, in term, uh, they came from organic matter millions of years ago, plants and animals. Uh, and so, uh, basically, uh, most polymers can be considered organic chemicals. So, uh, you know, go organic, use more plastics. So, it's kind of a... At any rate, uh, so let's talk about the details here with respect to how we're going to break this down. Uh, Mer again, now these are, the, these are the components that you, you will need to understand when we're developing all of this. Because we're going to talk about the, the, the chemical structure of polymers and then start looking into some other aspects, crystallinity, the, the polymerization process, etc., etc., and the types um, and structures. But anyway, so myrrh, as we said up here, 
that is the repeating unit in a polymer chain, okay? The repeating unit, all right? It's not a single element necessarily. Uh, and I've given you an example here, C2H4. That is probably the most prevalent of all of these MERS. It is what we call the ethylene MER, the ethylene MER. It is the repeating unit. And, and uh, the next uh, board that I, that I cover, um, I will go through that in detail as to what that looks like and how it's structured uh, and how you're to, to uh, denote it uh, as a uh, MER in a repeating chain. Uh, and then the monomer, the monomer is simply mono meaning one, is just a single mer unit, a single mer unit. And when we when we when we draw the the um, the actual uh, <clears throat> monomer, uh, I can show you how that there is a nomenclature that there is an, an n at the bottom, and that's that's the number of those repeating units. Uh, but that's what N stands for, and I'll, and I'll give that to you. I don't have room here to draw it up, but I'll show that what, what that looks like. Uh, but again, monomer is a single mer unit, all right? Uh, and polymer, of course, are many mer units that have been uh, established along a chain. Now, inside of this, inside of this repeating unit, the, the carbon and the hydrogen are bonded covalently. Because <clears throat> the carbon in the outer shell has four electrons, it needs two more, and so here comes hydrogen. Uh, so if you have two carbons and four hydrogens, it's a perfect match between hydrogen needing one and carbon uh, needing those uh, two. So they 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 bond perfectly, share perfectly in a covalent means here. Uh, so a polymer is many mer units along a chain. Where the n can equal minimally, uh, you know, ten to the third, or even greater, usually greater than that, the number of repeating units in this in this long, long chain. Um, now, the degree of polymerization. So, when you have a a monomer and you want to turn it into a polymer, many of those added together along this long chain. You have to go through a process called polymerization, and uh, that's why we have uh, plastics uh, refineries, or not refineries, but plastic chemical units all up and down the coast of Texas. Uh, you know, Dow Chemical, BASF, uh, DuPont, all those companies are all up and down the uh, coast of Texas because they do polymerization processes there because of the, again, the main building block of these of these uh, chemicals uh, or carbon based or or you know hydrocarbons and that's the perfect source for that is natural gas and so that's the building block so they go through and polymerize and what they're doing is they're they're breaking up this this double bond between these two and separating on either side so then it can connect to another one to another one to another one. and again I'll show you how that works but that's what they're doing. It's the like actual polymerization process. And what that relates to is the average number of mer units in a chain. So that could be, you know, 10 to the third. It could be, you know, a million, whatever it might be. Uh, but that's the degree of polymer polymerization. And it's an average, okay? The, the, it's an average. Not a specific exact number. It's impossible to, to determine that. But what we do is we come up with what we call an average uh, on that. Okay, so uh, I'm going to erase this, and I want to kind of build a uh, polymer uh, tree here, so to speak, uh, showing where these polymers break down into the basic types. So let's see. Alrighty. Uh, so we're going to start up here at the top, of course, uh, with just the overall heading of polymers, all right? Uh, and then we're going to break this down into two basic subcategories. And one we're just going to call plastics. And that's what we're going to spend the most time on, plastics. 
Uh, and the other is, is the other category would be elastomers. And they behave completely different. Elastomers. All right, they behave completely different than polymers. Now, we're not going to spend really any time on elastomers, um, kind of like we didn't spend much time on non-ferrous metals. Uh, but elastomers are materials basically that at room temperature, of course, they can stretch greatly, you know, beyond twice their average length, uh, and then release it goes completely right back to where it was. So it stretches and, and, and goes back, stretches and goes back. Uh, you know, uh, rubber is, is an excellent example of that, and um, all different kinds of uh, different types of elastomers that are out there. Uh, neoprene, things like this, uh, you know, made out of gaskets and such. Uh, so, but we're, again, we're not really going to talk about elastomers much. We're going to concentrate over here on plastics, okay? Now, from here, we're going to take this. And we're going to bifurcate this into two main major headings, all right? And the first heading we're going to call thermoplastics. Thermoplastics, all right? Major category of plastics. Thermoplastics, and the other one we're going to call thermoset plastics. Thermo set plastic. Oops, I missed the box a little bit. It's okay. All right, so we have thermoplastics and thermoset. Now, these are really based upon, the two are based upon how they react to heat. Uh, that's what really is taking place here between these two. So let's let's set these apart. Thermoplastics are plastics basically that only only undergo give me a new pen here undergo uh, a let's see if I can find a better one here running out of pens only undergo a physical change a physical change uh, when exposed to uh, elevated temperatures okay thermoplastics only undergo a physical change when exposed to elevated temperatures and then and then revert back. Uh, in other words, they're going to go from uh, at room temperature uh, as a solid will then go to at an elevated temperature. Okay, this would be room temperature and this is elevated temperature would go to uh, a liquid. So you would go this direction, and then when you remove the heat, this goes back to a solid. So it goes back and forth, back and forth. So it really just undergoes, again, a physical change when subjected to elevated temperatures. And elevated temperatures for most thermoplastics begin to uh, um, uh, liquefy or melt. Uh, some as low as 300 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, some as high as 550, 600 degrees. Uh, and actually, uh, some of them really don't melt completely at all, but we'll talk about the special cases of some of those thermoplastics later. But primarily, so this is very obviously recyclable kind of a material where you can heat it up uh, and, and, and put it in what we call a melt processable state, process it into something, uh, I mean, I mean, here's a perfect example, uh, a nice little uh, scotch tape holder here. Um, and melt it, put it into a, uh, a mold uh, upon you know pressure, and uh, come out with something that looks like this when it solidifies. And then um, just take more of that, heat it up, melt it, let it solidify, et cetera, et cetera, just back and forth, back and forth. Um, so those are what thermoplastics are about. Okay, and they, again, just undergo a physical change. 
and um, there goes the, the buzzer. But uh, thermoplastics uh, are probably the most predominant ones that, that, that you'll see from a consumer base standpoint. Uh, I mean, you know, go to Walmart or any store and you look at all the plastic containers. Uh, everybody that's drinking, you know, this, this water out of these bottles uh, is obviously a thermoplastic and a specific type of a thermoplastic. So I'll go through those, those families or, or categories a little bit later with you also. But um, so a lot, a lot of these and obviously they're very recyclable. Uh, and, and, and thermoplastics again have such a, a wide variety uh, and I'll give some benefits here uh, in a little bit. Okay, uh, now, as I told you, some of them, some of them actually don't necessarily melt, but most of them are what we call melt processable. Melt processable. Processable. I think I misspelled that. Accessible. Any rate. Okay, melt processable. All right. Uh, okay. Now, uh, let's see. These melt processable means that they can they can be uh, heated, liquefied, and injected under pressure into an open cavity closed mold and make products. All right. Um, and and most of them are that way. Now, there's two different types of melt processable, and, and it's all due to the crystallinity, uh, whether or not it actually has a specific melting temperature or whether it has more of a softening range temperature. And that, again, has to do with its crystallinity, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later. Um, okay, so, uh, and then, but again, some of them aren't because, because of the, the the problem is there's just too many, too many of those MERS, too many of those those individual repeat units. Uh, they can be so entangled, they can't they can't ever completely get untangled, and and uh, so it really never completely liquefies. It'll 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 get soft and kind of like a jelly maybe, but it won't completely uh, turn into what we call a melt processable one that's capable of being injected under pressure um, into, like, like I said, into a uh, open cavity closed mold to make a product. So, all right, so I ran out of time. Uh, we will we will come back and I'll start on thermal set plastics um, and, and continue on there and into the basic structure of what these monomers look like.